today I'm here to talk about dependencies because sometimes when you want to install Ben's evil gems or if you want to see, if you want to run your code against the weird uh, edge cases you can have on different implementations of Ruby, you have to actually install the code and make it run, make it run into production. And I'm Greg. I have this impossible to pronounce name and Twitter handle. And I can't change it anymore because I'm known by this name now. So thank you, Dad. I'm a software developer. I'm, a, I'm an infrastructure developer. I write code that builds servers automatically. I work for a consultancy based in France. I moved to Berlin in the beginning of this year. Uh, small warning, I'm going to talk about dependency hell, and I'm going to show real life examples of what you will have. How, do, how many people here are mostly working on web development, Sinatra, Rails, stuff like this? OK, so you probably don't have those issues, but I think it's important to know that it can happen if you actually use Ruby to distribute command line applications. Uh, in my experience, dependency hell in Ruby kind of looked like this scary picture of fish that I got from a friend just before, like last week. Doesn't make any sense, but I like it. So before you can install your gems, you need to install Ruby. As developers, we always use tools like RVM or RBN or chruby and all that stuff. But when you actually have to give a program to a client, it's written in Ruby, and it's not going to read the README. So the first thing is it's going to probably use Linux, some kind of VM or a server somewhere. And its first reflex is going to be, OK, I'm installing Ruby. My, my guy just told me he's giving me some Ruby code. And you're going to get Ruby 1.8, which is going to be a problem, because nobody writes that stuff anymore. So Maybe he's going to notice it if he's technical, and he's going to install Ruby 1.9.3, which is Ruby 1.9.1 in Debian and Ubuntu because of the ABI compatibility version. And if you install a gem that's requiring a C extension, you're going to get a nice, friendly user message like this. You have to know that this means you don't have a compiler. You don't have any way to install C extensions in your Ruby. So that doesn't work either. Uh, there is a pack package that's called Ruby 191 full, and it actually only installs st stuff that you don't need, like TKLTK support and some font stuff to run graphical applications. Uh, so th this could be a better way to install the dev dependencies and all right to get documentation. You get another nice message. In the end, you just need to install C compiler and some libraries, and even more depending on the kind of C extension you're going to build. So that's just the beginning. Now we need to just get into gems. Uh, Ruby is kind of old by now. It's more than a teenager. It's 20 years old. The first public version was released in 95. 1.0 was released in 96, and it took until 10 years ago to actually have a package management system for the language. So that's, it's still on GitHub, you still have access to the history. And that's, I mean, if I read 2003, it doesn't seem that long ago, but when you see it's actually from 10 years ago in the GitHub page, it looks kind of older. So it, everyone, if you've used Rails, you've used it to install it, and it allows you to install list and install dependencies. You even get development dependencies for when you just don't want to put our spec in production, which doesn't make much sense. And it's now part of MRI 1.9, so it's pretty easy to get going. Before Rails 2.1, you had to, we didn't use gems for plugins. We just copy them as files and do the dependencies by hand. We still needed some gems for stuff like XML parsing and image manipulation and all that stuff. And basically, when, we, when you wanted to install a Rails app, you would op hopefully copy dependencies from the readme. But sometimes the readme was just generated by 
was just pretty much empty, and you would just have to run it and see which failures you had and just add the dependencies one by one. Uh, a couple years later, they included a way to have dependencies for your for every environment or only one. And the problem is you had to install the gem, and then you could install the dependencies. It almost solved the, solved the problem, but only for Rails apps, and you had some really weird issues, so just not a good solution. Then came Bundler, which we all know and love, because the problem I'm going to talk about is pretty much solved for Rails apps and Sinatra apps. You specify the versions in a config file, you have a command to install it. It gives you a nice lock file to keep the same dependencies on dev and production. It even provides you isolation if you want to, which is a pretty nice song by Joy Division, by the way. Uh, you can package all your gems into a folder and then add it to Git and deploy it that way. So problem solved. I'm out. But that's not exactly the case for apps, application, command like applications. I ran into three different kind of problems in the last few years. Uh, it's mostly things that happened to me as a sysadmin, but also as someone who just wanted to give my customer some apps to run and some, just to create some servers. So it's it's a problem you would have if you distribute applications as a developer as well. So the first one is from a couple months ago. We built an infrastructure a couple years ago using Chef. At the time, the version was 0.10.10. And we realized that even though we had a completely automated infrastructure, you had a bootstrap script that would just create a new server in one command, it used to work until new releases of gems got released. And you have this new error that didn't happen a couple months ago and didn't happen back then, which is that NetSSH, NetSSH Multi, and NetSSH Gateway have dependencies that conflict with each other. So here are some nice to read code from the gem specs. So Chef depends on any version higher than this one and lower than 2.3 expecting semantic versioning. And SSH multi depends on, so this one is compatible with this one. And it depends on SSH gateway, which is the latest one, which requires a newer version of SSH. So that's why you can install it in one command. So what you have to do is go through Ruby gems and find the latest version of SSH that's compatible with the lower version which is this one. So basically, what you have to do to install the gems from two years ago is dependency by hand, dependency resolving by hand, which is kind of a problem. I mean, it works, but if I just, I'm missing a slide here. OK. So to install just this old gem from two years ago, you just need to go through some steps. And in the end, you can just install it after Missing some slides. But once you've sold the dependencies, you still can run into issues because this gem depended on Moneta, which is an interface for key value stores. And that version of Chef depends on any version of Moneta. And what happened is a new version was released, and it's basically a new project that just took over and just replaced the version. So the API is completely different, and nothing can work that's depending on the old version. So what you have to do is uninstall the old version and install manually the new one before you install Chef. In the end, you just need to install at least two different gems before having your working gem. And I wrote a small blog article about it for a previous version, but you get the same problem, basically. Another problem you can run into is unstable public APIs. And this is going to sound weird, but it only works in French. 
This is a really, really huge pain point. Uh, it's a problem that's really well described in Bounder's website. Um, if you use specific versions, you can be compatible. You can you can install uh, different gems because they would just conflict. If you constrain too little, that's the problem we had with Chef. You get a new release that's just breaking because the API changed. And if you expect things to work and just change the minor version when it's changing the API, then it would work. But most of the time, people just, uh, by mistake, they would just change the API of using a patch version. And that's what happens all the time. So because of the lack of isolation in Ruby gems, if you install a new gem, it would just use the new one, just because it's compatible according to the gem spec, but it would just change the behavior and change the API. A good example of this is JSON, which is now in the standard library, but there's been 121 versions of this gem in eight years. So that's about this big. And notice all the old Windows ones are just yanked, so you can't install them anymore. That means that this JSON gem is just changing the API. All, uh, the, the API of this gem, which is just parsing JSON, is changing all the time. And you see people just specifying j the dependency on JSON that way, using a lower and higher version that's supposed to be compatible with. And it can, you can run into pretty annoying issues because of that. We use a handler for Chef to send, um, to send messages on Campfire. And the specific plugin requir requires any version of Tinder, which is a uh, library to send messages to, to Campfire. The problem is, in two patch releases, they depend on a different version of JSON. So depending on, depending on the day you install your server, you're going to get different versions of compatibility. So the first day would work, and on the second day would just break and not work anymore. So once again, we have to fix dependencies by hand. And this is such a common issue with JSON that if you read the gem spec from Chef newer versions, they specifically say that the JSON gem breaks all the time, and that's why you need you can't use you can't rely on semantic versioning because it's breaking all the time anyway. So in a way, the well-known works for me turns into it works today because I have no idea if what I'm installing now is going to work tomorrow, even though I'm automating it. Everything is automated. It's not human error. I'm not copying and pasting stuff from a readme. I'm just executing scripts, and it's, I'm not going to get the same behavior all the time. The lack of isolation that's solved in Bundler, you don't, you don't get if you just install gems and just use binaries. So for instance, if you have a gem that specifies any version of those gems, that means that if any other gem installs newer versions of those dependencies, you can just change the API, and then your backup system is not going to work anymore. So since I'm not just here to bitch, and I'm going to actually give you some solutions, there's no perfect solution for this problem, but just some, some tips. Keep your dependencies up to date, which is causing another problem, because you can get breaking changes. So read code before you deploy it. But we, as Ruby developers, we live in an ecosystem where if you don't follow and don't keep up to date, you're going to get hacked and you're going to have breaking dependencies. So you need to in update your stuff all the time and be careful about it because that can give you some problems. And I just lost my screen. So another tip is just, it's a basic tip as a sysadmin. Things will break. It's not a matter of 
whether it's going to happen or not. Things will break all the time, so you need to be ready and expect things to break. And I have a couple of solutions. The first one is just using RVM and gem sets. But I mean, since people can follow simple instructions in README, I don't want to have to explain that they're using something that allows you to use multiple rubies just to run one and then type some commands to use gem sets. So it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, use JRuby. That's something I was interested in, but I'm using Chef, so I can't use it. It doesn't run on, on JRuby. Uh, there's some solutions to pack your Ruby application in one single binary, and I never tried it. You can also that's something I toyed with before, choosing another way is just building meta gems to have more specific versions of the gems and just specify stuff that works together to fix other gems that don't work together but should. Uh, hacking something with Bundler is something I've done for a previous customer. And it was kind of easy to do because the app was distributed as a Git repo. So we just didn't have to install it. Everything was just wrapped. Every time you run the binary, it would just install the dependencies using Bundler and it worked. But it doesn't solve the problem for me for running Chef, for instance. And in the, way, in, in the end, my favorite way of solving this problem was just vendoring all the things and building system packages. Vagrant and Chef do it. So that's how I. In the beginning, when Vagrant announced that they would not release gems anymore as a Ruby project, everyone was just like, what's happening? And I, I felt the same way. But they just were having problems with net SSH and JSON and all those dependencies all the time. Because every time someone would install something else on the same Ruby, things would, would break. So it's basically impossible to just give support to customers that way. Uh, but building distribution packages is like the worst job ever. I wouldn't recommend it to my worst enemy. So I wonder if I could just do avoid using crazy tools and having to write manifests and all that crazy stuff. In the end, uh, Chef is using Omnibus, and I'm using Buncher, which is based on Rake. Uh, it's a DSL for building packages and software, and it just installs software and then creates a big package with everything bundled inside, all the libraries and your Ruby and your gems, everything in one package. And then you can just distribute that package. You only have a dependency on libc. Um, yeah, it's, as I say, as a Rubyist, it's based on, on Rake, so it's pretty simple to work with. Um, it's using FPM. They don't dare using that word on the README, but it's, it's meant to be fucking package manager because that's the only way you can just work with package managers. And it kind of looks like this if you use it by hand. Uh, if you want to use it through Buncher, it's going to look like this. You just specify your name, and then you just use the standard configure and make, and make install after downloading the package. So it's pretty, pretty simple. And then for a package, it's the same way, it's name of the package, some metadata that you just easily add, just like a, just like a gem, and then your dependencies and the files you're going to, to use, and then it's going to package all that thing. You can just run it to the VM or on EC2 or anywhere, and then it just gives you a package. You can put it on S3 or a package manager somewhere. And your rake file looks like this. You just set up where you want to build stuff and where you want to install stuff. You load the recipes. And you have a, pack, a default rake task that just building any package you want. So I recommend you check out FPM, even though you don't use it through Buncher, just to build packages and have a self self package environment that doesn't explode every time someone installs a new gem on the system. That's the URL on GitHub. Uh, it can build Debian. Red Hat packages, depending on the system you run it on. So if you want to build a Debian package, you need to be running on a Debian system. And if you want to build a Red Hat system on, on a Red Hat system. And for the last, talk, last uh, part of the talk, I wanted to see how other programming languages would 
deal with the problem of dependencies and versioning and stuff breaking all the time. So I had a look at Google Go, and they have kind of weird approach because that's how you get a package. You, you, they don't have centralized. They, they don't have something like Ruby Gems that's centralized. You can just get the dependencies on a Git or Mercurial repo, and then in the code you just import it without versions. Without versions. So since you're using Git or Mercurial, you just use the master branch as the stable version of the library. That means that you never introduce breaking API changes, which Ruby people do anyway in patch releases. So I have no idea if it works in real life and if it's just not going to fail next year. So if you have experience using those libraries in Go, I'm interested to talk about it. Uh, here's a good explanation about how it works for Rubyists on this blog. And this quote is pretty nice from this other article. And this guy is just having problems with the way things work in Go. So he's using submodules to work around the lack of versions, to have an isolation between different apps, because otherwise you just have you can have multiple well, if you, you basically have to have a different machine for every environment, for every app you have, because it's supposedly you're supposed to have stable, stable API all the time, so the version you use of the library doesn't matter anyway. So there's a couple problems you can have and a couple solutions about the same problem in Go. Do you have any questions? Hello. Um, have you heard about Docker and what do you think about it? Can you repeat the name? Docker. Yeah. Have you? Do, do you like it? I played a little with it and it took me a while. I, I've, I've seen the video and I've played with it and I didn't exactly get how you're supposed to work with it. And then I saw a demo at DevOps Days in Berlin and I finally got how the kind of workflow you're supposed to use with it. And it's pretty interesting, and it's something I'm going to play with pretty soon. Basically, you use containers, and your containers are versions like in, like in Git, and you can just clone a running container, running a process. And you, basically, if you want to just deploy a Ruby app, you would have one um, unicorn process running in a VM, and then you would clone it to have multiple versions of that process. You run one process per... Um, container, and you have an API that allows you to just do, do that, and it also routes requests from your central... You can, put, you can have one of, the, one of the containers behind a load balancer and just put all the unicorns behind it and stuff like this. So if you have experience with it, I'm interested in talking about it, because I've just played with it. We just had uh, Solomon uh, uh, Hicks uh, from the cloud uh, in, at Paris Abbey, and uh, he did a presentation. It will be um, there. Will be a video in French soon. Okay. Yeah, so definitely check out Docker if you never heard about it. Yeah, please do. It's really the, the images and containers. The images get versioned. Yeah. Uh, um, with Go, uh, what you produce is a single static. Uh, binary. Yeah, for deployment. Yeah. So uh, basically, you will never, you know, break your production unless you're, you know, if it doesn't compile, it doesn't compile, and you shouldn't be deploying uh, 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 stuff that wasn't compiled yeah. because it's impossible to do. Yeah. So it's kind of a totally different thing from Ruby, where the production kind of mir mir miraculously by itself can break. So I, I'm yeah, I wasn't clear enough. Uh, you, with Go, you can only have problem in development. In Ruby, you have problem in development and production. <laughs> Docker is in Go. Yeah. So, uh, so updating Docker is changing a static, single static binary. And yeah. Yeah. So, 
I have a question. Uh, have you played at all with uh, Linegan or dependency management in, in Clojure? And, and, and in particular, I, I found one thing really interesting. Um, they, they almost have the exact opposite attitude where they don't think that you should be updating your dependencies all the time. You should find a set that work okay. and then fix them to specific versions. So there's not even a way to specify ranges of versions. Um, and, and then sort of that's you know, just how, how it works. What, what's your take on that? Do you think it's something that we could do as, as I mean, Rubyists? From what I've seen, I don't think the Ruby community is mature enough to have libraries that just go on forever, especially when, as you've seen, we have problems with stuff that was released a couple months ago, just, just that worked at some point in the past and just stops working because of how dependencies work. So I think we need to be more mature because before we can just think about something like this. And we have too much of, we have tons of libraries, but we have tons of security issues as well. So we need to release patches all the time. Uh, did you consider using the standalone flag of uh, Bundler? It wouldn't solve all, all the problems you are showing, but most of them. It's even more segregated than the regular deployment flag or uh, vendoring. It's, it's really interesting. It doesn't vendor Ruby, but everything else. Okay. And you don't even need the Bundler um, runtime. You don't need okay. anything. Do you get wrapper, wrappers that there's just isolate the dependencies? If you run a binary, does it get the gems only from the gem set or from the whole system? It's even more segregated, be segregated because it's using um, a bundler setup file mm -hmm. with um, specifying every every dependency in the load in load path okay. of Ruby, and and it, Ruby doesn't see anything else, only those. And with the bin, bin stubs of um, Bundler, you, you, you get everything. So you only need Ruby. Okay, interesting. Yeah. That's also one of, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this talk is that it's something that's been bothering me for a while. And I tried a couple of approaches. And I'm interested in seeing anyone's, anyone else's uh, take on this, because it's something that's, that's a real, real problem. And thanks. Uh, just uh, there's also a very interesting thingy uh, Nick Sos uh, Nix, it's a Haskell uh, dependency management uh, yeah, platform. it's an OS as and well. It's, yeah, it's also <laughs> an OS, but uh, a Linux distribution basically, and it's really interesting because uh, because of its purely functional uh, way of life. You basically cannot have it's impossible to have uh, a contradictory uh, uh, or incompatible uh, yeah. dependencies. So it's kind of it's proven, to, it's basically proven to work. Yeah, so. thanks for mentioning this, because I had this in my notes before I wrote the talk, and I forgot to mention it. Uh, so it's, what's, what's the name again? Nix or NixOS, N-I-X. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. N-I-X-O-S.org, Yeah, and it allows you to do stuff like have different versions of Firefox on the same OS with different dependencies. You can just have multiple versions of the same program, just having the different libraries and stuff like this. So it's really powerful, but I have no idea if people use it in production. So that's... When it's a problem to have only one working, so if you have a couple of them, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> and have you played with Omnibus? Uh, I forgot to mention that Buncher is a re-implementation of the same ideas of, as Omnibus, oh. and it's used by Sensu, which is a monitoring software. And at the time where they had the same problem, they just decided to build their own because Omnibus was written in Clojure, and they just wanted to write it in Ruby. So it's now. Ops code rewrote their tool using Ruby, so it's the same ideas, and I just like Buncher better because it's based on Rake, and it seemed to be simpler to get the same end result. And does it solve the problem of uh, dynamic libraries like uh, libxml2 and, uh, you know? <laughs> the packages you build that way just have a dependency on libc, 
Yeah. And that's about it. So you, you have so, every, every, every kind of libxml thing that you have is just in the package, and your Ruby is just going to use it because it's there, it's in the one package you, you built. So, but is there a way to, to say in something like um, a, gem, a gem spec file that you, you need libxml2, for instance? Do we have something like that in the wild? I don't think so. Don't think so. So you just That's run it and seek break, and then you have to Google for the result, yeah. <laughs> I guess. Which is actually a good point. Um, like a lot of Ruby gems could do that better and give you actual messages like, oh, you're missing libxml2, libxslt. We notice you're on Debian. This installs it. Yeah. Um, like lots of gems could do that, but usually they just give you a stack trace and you figure it out. Yeah, and stuff about MKFM and stuff like this, and it's impossible to know what actually broke. <laughs> yeah, and there's something else. I mean, if it's just uh, a text message, there's, you can't automate anything. So we still miss the right tool to handle that, I think. Um, one more question? Is that it? Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>